The year is 1907. Japan is still reeling from its brutal clash with the Russian Empire. And in the frigid tundra of Hokkaido, a desperate war hero is panning for riches a decade too late. The gold rush has long subsided, but soon he will find himself embroiled in a much larger treasure hunt, with a payload so vast that parties are already killing each other over the mere notion of it. These bloody campaigns, peopled by the insane and the insanely lovable alike, paint Japan's white north red in search of the gold. And like any good treasure hunt, this one comes with a map. Satoru Noda's Golden Kamui, a manga that recently wrapped up a tireless 8-year, 31-volume run, is nothing short of a masterpiece. During that run, his Hokkaido epic proved itself to be a great many things. Purposeful, yet erratic. Beautiful and horrific. Po-faced and utterly batshit insane. It runs the gamut of tone and tempo, resulting in something utterly unlike anything I've experienced before. You'll likely have to acclimate somewhat to its unique blend of dark comedy, face-melting violence, and heart-on-sleeve earnestness. But once you do, once you sift through the blood and poop it superficially delights in, you'll find something wonderfully unique. Set in the dying days of Japan's tumultuous Meiji era, as the country shaped itself into the superpower it would become by leaving behind much of its romantic past, Golden Kamui makes the most of its rapidly evolving stage. Aging samurai cling to their swords, whilst everyone else takes up rifles and explosives. War heroes turned social pariahs, look to the relatively untamed north in hopes of work, a new life, or simply a place to die in peace. Pioneers colonise the land, ushering in a future the native Ainu are not only disinterested in, but excluded from. The parallels to America's Wild West are everywhere, and yet, Golden Kamui bleeds a blood all its own, thoroughly Japanese and un-Japanese all at once. Its Hokkaiden vistas are arresting and alien. Its deep dive into the culture of a once disappearing people, rich and authentic. We meet our hero, Saichi Sugimoto, as he attempts to navigate this new world. He's a hard-to-kill bastard, nicknamed the Immortal Sugimoto, for his death-defying performance in the recent Russo-Japanese War. And yet Hokkaido tests even him. It's painted as a truly lethal place, where death sets up shop in every avalanche, under the surface of each hypothermic river, and on the tips of every bloody bear claw. Hokkaido, Golden Kamui posits, wants to kill you. So, when Sugimoto hears about an unfathomably large treasure, the map to which is tattooed across the bodies of 24 escaped convicts, he knows he'll need some help. A guide to navigating Hokkaido's many, many pitfalls. Enter a Shiripa, a young and tenacious Ainu native with a fierce love and respect for the land she has grown up on. Together, alongside a rapidly expanding cast of memorable characters, they hunt dangerous animals, even more dangerous men, and an obscene amount of gold. 
The indigenous people of Hokkaido, the Ainu, are inarguably Golden Kamui's beating heart. Their rich culture extensively explored over the length of its run. It's not just local colour in the margins of the page, either. For every bout of frantic fisticuffs, there's an involved Ainu hunt. Each tense sniper showdown is balanced by an exploration of their spiritual beliefs and practices. And cooking local delicacies enjoys more focus than every white-knuckle action set-piece combined. Meticulously researched and painstakingly portrayed, Noda dedicated a year of his life to study before he ever set pen to paper, and his commitment to authenticity shows. As Sugimoto visits their kotan, breaks bread with their people, and submerges himself in their culture, so do we, and it's a unique and eye-opening experience. What's especially refreshing about the Ainu is that they are presented as a culture in flux. When we explore other cultures in our media, especially the oft-exoticized native peoples of any land, they are a fixed point, a laundry list of interesting divergences from our own cultural norms. The Ainu in Golden Kamui are an evolving people, portrayed in the middle of an intergenerational divide. A Shirpa speaks of her people's customs and beliefs, and in her more traditional grandmother, we see these routines upheld and respected. But a Shirpa considers herself a new Ainu woman, for a new age. Only old people bother doing that, she states, when asked why she doesn't feed her guardian spirit. It's in wonderfully observed moments like these that exemplify an earnest depiction of the Ainu as a living people, instead of a simplified snapshot of a culture boiled down to their bullet points. It's an attention to detail lavished upon every aspect of the work. In its opening chapters, Golden Kamui feels a little pornographic in its depictions of weapons. These lovingly illustrated firearms portrayed as something as beautiful as they are deadly. But just as much time is spent obsessing over the world's flora and fauna, its predators and prey, the beautiful and broken bodies of our burly boys, exquisitely rendered food, and about a farm's worth of feces once all is said and done. Despite this story enjoying some of the most ludicrous arcs and utterly unbelievable story beats, it's all tethered to the real world. Golden Kamui exists in a fixed point in time, with plenty of characters based on their real-life counterparts, and explosive events lining up with history's broadest strokes. <laughs> Through his plentiful asides, Noda is always keen to flex his status as a Renaissance man, to share a wealth of knowledge over a variety of subjects, and his world and storytelling is richer for it. But a colourful world would mean little without an equally vibrant group to stalk across it. Luckily for us all, Golden Kamui boasts one of the strongest cast of characters I've ever encountered, in this or any other medium. Whether it's the delightfully immature escape artist, Shiraishi, the mysterious fortune teller in Karmat, the absolutely unhinged Surumi, or the terrifyingly detached sniper, Ogata, these stars are fascinatingly penned beasts, and the compassion and conviction offered to each of them surprised me at every turn especially considering just how many of them there are. Whether series mainstays, or side characters that leave a lasting impression in just a handful of chapters, 
the work groans under a cast of memorable faces. As that cast swells, it falters a little, threatening to become a lurching affair as the narrative rockets back and forth between large groups of warring players. But before long, the energy of such a thoroughly split narrative is woven into something harmonious. As the hunt escalates and these parties clash, time and time again, allegiances shift unexpectedly and often. The theme of predator and prey is an obsession here. Whether Sugimoto and Ashiripa are hunting game, or tattooed convicts. And the story loves playing with, and often inverting, these roles. An enemy with Sugimoto in his sights one moment, may be shoulder to shoulder with him the next, and this shifting focus allows for every character to play both hero and villain. Golden Kamui understands the reductive nature of such labels, in a way few stories do, and shrugs off those hollow limitations to pursue each character's humanity instead. The most deliciously detestable leads are offered understanding, humour and empathy, whilst our upstanding and courageous protagonists are tested, and often found wanting. Golden Kamui pays as much attention to the trauma of its heroes as it does their ridiculous antics, sidestepping a story about war in favour of a story about what war does to those that survive it. It tenderly explores their guilt and hints at redemption for even the nastiest bastards on the mountain. In doing so, we get to know each and every one of them, inside and out, in some cases to an uncomfortable degree, and whilst I never knew exactly who I wanted to survive any given skirmish, I was desperately invested nevertheless. That is a narrative magic trick I've rarely seen achieved. There wasn't a character I didn't love by the story's close, a dangerous relationship to have, with a manga that delights in ripping its players apart in increasingly gruesome ways. Death comes for anyone, often swift and unheralded, no matter how beloved or interesting they are. That threat hangs particularly heavy over a story full of people you want to see more of. <laughs> Golden Kamui certainly isn't for the squeamish. Even by the standards of its most claret-stained contemporaries, its chapters are full of bloody dismemberments and faces slipping off under the errant paw of a roaming bear. But even beyond the detailed and unrestrained bloodletting, it delights in the distasteful. Some of the escaped convicts are more twisted and depraved than others, and it's in those outliers and the violent deaths they often meet where Golden Kamui cements itself as a darkly funny piece first and foremost. There's a vein of macabre humour that tests you initially and shocks you by the time you realise you're finally laughing at some of its most unsavoury punchlines. It's all in service of a story that wants to remind you, regardless of how authentic it is in its beautiful depictions of Ainu culture and the depth of its very human characters, never to take it entirely seriously. It's not scared to challenge its readers, to buck a trend or to dive headfirst into taboo and resurface laughing, or brandishing some new, stringy chunk of viscera. It results in a manga that pushes you away as often as it pulls you in. If you're interested by the setting, but concerned about the content, the animated adaptation neuters some of those harder to swallow beats, and does a decent job in translating the scribbled notes about history and heritage that gives the series its rich charm though it often fails to capture the strange beauty of Noda's original work. Regardless of how you experience Golden Kamui, I urge you to experience it nevertheless. It's a dense and impossibly layered affair, and something genuinely unique amongst its peers. 
wickedly addictive in both its core manhunt and the silly capers that sidetrack our gang. It will surprise you with graceful, poignant beats as often as it does irreverent exploits. If Golden Kamui can sometimes feel a little torn by the many directions Satoru Noda clearly wants to take it, it's a shortcoming that's easily forgiven when you see what he's able to do with the form when he is on top of his. Bleeding authenticity and earnestness at every turn, when it isn't just bleeding outright. Golden Kamui is a tapestry unlike any other, each disparate thread woven into something far greater than the sum of its parts. As always, thanks for watching. Apologies that this project took quite so long. It's been an unpredictable year for a number of reasons. But, amidst its various ups and downs, reading Golden Camry from start to finish has been a real highlight. As I closed that final volume with a big, dumb grin on my face, it effortlessly entered my all-time favourites of the medium. And I hope that, more than anything, I've convinced you to give this weird and beautiful title a go, so that you too can have a big dumb grin on your face. A huge thank you to my patrons, whose patience never fails to astound me. I'm hoping to get back on track in the coming months with a number of shorter projects, and some exciting videos I've been working on behind the scenes. For just a dollar, you can join their ranks over at Patreon and ensure that I can keep making these videos about the strange and wonderful worlds of manga, anime, and beyond. If, instead, you'd rather I cover different strange and wonderful worlds, hit the like button and I'll start a channel dedicated solely to eating Ainu cuisine. Hina Hina. <laughs>